Welcome to Reimagine Work, a podcast dedicated to questioning our modern conception of work and its role in our lives. I'm your host, Paul Millard, and I have conversations with philosophers, authors, creators, freelancers, and vagabonds who are trying to make sense of this question in their own lives. Join me while I try to navigate the emerging future of work. If you'd like to read more of my writing, explore this podcast, or find ways to work with me, you can go to think-boundless.com. Today, I am getting nerdy with Vizakan Virasami, a Twitter friend with a mission to find friendly nerds around the world, introduce them to each other, and build robust, nourishing communities. Welcome to the podcast, Visa. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. It seems the internet was a huge channel for you early in your life. Yes. And you were writing about not fitting into that default path of success, the education Mm -hmm. system, and sharing your thoughts. Mm Mm-hmm. When was the first moment you kind of thought about the internet as a thing? Um, I mean, so I was exposed to it directly before I started theorizing about it or whatever. So it kind of, you know, it was a very um, get your hand, get your feet wet, get your hands dirty kind of thing for me. So the story I sometimes tell people is that let me let me kind of try and retrace my early internet steps, which was, you know, so the first thing I did as a child was to look for video games and look for i think like video game cheat codes and stuff like that and i found a forum for a very niche game that i was playing it's called the game is called darkstone it's like a it's made by a very small company it's like a diablo 1.5 kind of clone and uh none of my friends played it but i found the forum of the company and i found the forum like google wasn't even popular then so i found it through the booklet in the CD case, and they said, oh, this is our website. So I went to the website, and there's a forum there. And on the forum, there were, like, dozens of people who also played the game. And I'm like, wow. So, you know, like, be- because you don't- the internet isn't really a thing yet. It's kind of a novelty, like a yeah. fax machine or whatever. And here I was. Uh, I-, I was spending hours on this game on my own. Nobody to talk to about it. And then, you know, there's a bunch of, there's a string of text which is like HTTP slash Delphin software, blah, blah, blah. And I typed that into my browser. I think I was using like Netscape Navigator at the time. And here there were other people who would talk to me about the game that I was playing. So it was like, whoa, it's a string of, it's like a magic incantation, right? Like you you type in this thing and now you can talk to people from around the world. And that just, very early on, that was like a, you know, so it's, it's difficult to, accurately recreate your younger states because the language that you had at the time was not so precise so i don't so now when i talk about it i'm like oh it opened up a whole new world and i it just seemed exciting i guess so as a child i was like you know i have my my life outside of the screen which is you know i and i do have friends and you know we 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 play how old was I? Seven, eight. Yeah, we play in the playground, running around and stuff. But then I could come to this magical hyperspace, cyberspace thing, which just seemed like an entire different universe. And I just wanted to experience more of that as much as I could. I wanted. I knew very early on that I wanted my own website. So I had like a personal homepage with like a guest book and like a list of jokes. Uh, guest you know, books. I, I love that. Yeah. Like just, it's just... I wanted to have a space on the web that was mine. And, you know, another another kind of uh, riff that I do is like, a, I think, I'm not sure if it was, if it was Richard Feynman or, hmm, I can't remember, somebody, somebody wrote something about, I think it might have been Steve Wozniak, who wrote about um, fiddling with a ham radio as a child. And again, it's kind of the same thing where, you know, you have this, this, this device and you tinker with it. And then you can go and you can just broadcast. Um, you can find a frequency and you'd be like, hi, I am call sign, whatever, on this frequency. And then you might get like a, a captain of a ship from the Navy or from you know, a merchant ship. And they're like, hello, call sign. We are, this is Admiral so-and-so. Like, I we read you. And you're like, holy shit, I'm a child. And an Admiral is talking to me. And then you just, that just opens up your, your concept of what is possible. And, right. and you just want to spend more time doing it. I think even like Jim Carrey once, 
uh, he just he saw a talk show on TV and he just wrote a fan letter and he got a kind of a oh, this those, is a crazy story yeah right he gets like a cookie cutter response and it's like with the with the talk shows um like their letterhead and then it's like oh thank you Mr. Jim for writing in start do start, stay in school study hard maybe you'll have a good future that kind of thing but he was ecstatic he was like i wrote to hollywood and hollywood wrote back and like i'm in i'm in the i'm this is i'm going to do more of this right and then now he's so it's very interesting how all these origins tend to it tends to start out really small like just some little interaction but that little interaction is like the call to adventure it's like oh i can explore this that resonates. I explored on the internet. I think it was this product of the 90s, right? Mm-hmm. And you're kind of exploring solo, but there are other people. It's not fully developed yet. And in the US, we had AOL. So people were operating in these chat rooms. There was early gaming. And I think a lot of people our generation kind of disappeared or disconnected from that. Might have mm-hmm. gotten serious, quote unquote, about work. Mm-hmm. And I find a lot of people are reconnecting with that now, either nice. through Twitter, mm-hmm. um, getting into coding and kind of reconnecting and remembering, oh, I used to love kind of coding up random websites at GeoCities or Tripod or all these uh, early internet sites. Yeah. It seems that the internet helped you kind of overcome something you were facing in your life which was a lot of friction to actually do stuff. So the number two tag thing you've written about is procrastination. Right. And you wrote a lot about how there was just all these things you should be doing, but you didn't do when you were little, Mm -hmm. right? But um, it seems digitally you were able to kind of overcome that and just do a lot of stuff. What do you think was the difference between those two operating modes? Right. It's interesting to hear this from someone else because, uh, I mean, you're talking about my, my word vomits, right, that you're looking at, the yeah. tech cloud. And um, I was, so I never set out to write so much about procrastination. But, I mean, so that was just, that project was just me wanting to write as much as I could about anything and kind of really just, you know, I think... Um, Ed Sheeran has a quote that he was so some some guy uh, some guy in the audience asked Ed Sheeran like uh, I'm a songwriter as well how do I get good and Ed Sheeran used like this um, this tap water metaphor he talks about how if there's like an old tap and you first turn it on it kind of trickles a little bit and then it's dirty water because it hasn't been used in a long time and you kind of have to like open the tap and let the terrible stuff come out for a while before it eventually gets the good stuff and that's kind of my That resonated with me. That's kind of the same attitude I have towards um, writing. I'm like, if you want to become a writer or an artist or a paint, whatever it is you want to do, you're going to make a whole bunch of shitty stuff first before you get to the stuff that you really want to do. And I mean, and even your idea of what you want to do is itself a work in progress that you will modify as you develop more experience. And um, I'm not answering your question. Your question is about procrastination. Um, (laughs) You're procrastinating the question. Uh, I was trying to see if that would be useful context. Nice eh, context, but um, well, I was I was really shitty in school, so I did really well in school early on, and then later on, not so much. And then um, I couldn't get myself to study, and when I started work, uh, my work. So I used to think that oh, the reason I'm not doing well in school is probably because you know at some level school is bullshit. I mean, that's one narrative that I had. At some level, school is bullshit, and I'm not going to be able to force myself to do things that I don't want to do. Then I started work, and I, I was very, really blessed. I got hired to work in a in a startup where like the work environment was great, the work was interesting. Um, I wanted to do well at it, and yet I was constantly kind of getting distracted and and um, you know not doing the work that I wanted to do. And you know my boss was great. He was like a he was like my therapist. At our meetings, he'd be like, "No, so why didn't you do the thing that you're gonna do?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's because I'm a bad person." He's like, "No, no, don't give me that. Like, like what? Like talk talk me through it step by step. Like, why didn't you do?" I was like, "Well, I was planning to do it at this time, but then you know uh, there was an argument on Facebook, <laughs> that kind of thing." And I just wanted to really um, understand that. I, I guess I I kind of caught that bug from my boss so what my boss was really great at was 
he was more curious about me at the time than I was about myself. Like I had already at some point internalized you know, so my teachers would say, oh, you know, you're a smart kid, but you're lazy. I'm like, yeah, I guess. Sure. That sounds true. And then so I had kind of internalized this. I'm lazy. I'm distracted um, label for myself. And my boss didn't buy into that. He was like, no, I'm sure there's something else. I'm sure like, let's dig deeper. And just kind of, you know, I felt a sense of obligation has a bit of a loaded term. Like it's, it sounds a bit negative, but I felt like a positive obligation to, here's a guy who took a chance on me and he hired me and he's paying me and I feel like, and he's genuinely interested in me. So I feel like I should, you know, kind of rise to meet him at the level of his interest. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to understand myself as well as I can so that our conversations can be better and I can be a productive um, colleague. And yeah, so I just wanted to be done with it. And I mean, I'm not, not, I'm not done with it per se. I think it's one of those lifelong things. I think even like Leonardo da Vinci said in his journal, like I have wasted my days. And you know, if, if someone, if someone like da Vinci feels that he procrastinated, I don't right. think any of us will ever be free of it entirely. But again, there, I think there's, there's like stages to your relationship with, um, with the work that you're doing and your feelings about the work that you're doing and, if you're not doing what you want to be doing, how do you feel about that? Are you in denial? Are you honest about it? And so I, I, I think the reason I have so much writing on procrastination, which I don't really do anymore, by the way, I think that was like a 2013 to 2016, maybe that was like the dump. I think by 2015, I was pretty much done. So I basically read everything I could find on the subject. I read like hundreds of blog posts. I, I would read books, I would watch videos, I, I wanted to kind of understand the whole space. And I mean, this is kind of how I approach learning anything. But yeah, so I wanted to understand the whole idea space. What are like the recurring things people talk about? What are, Who has solved this problem and how have they solved it? Is it solvable at all? Is it like unsolvable for some people? Is it, you know, is it um, psychological? Is it contextual? Is it the environment? Is it the the mindset and uh, spoiler it's everything <laughs> but yeah. like um yeah i i just i i it occurred to me and my boss made it clear to me that you know i had i think i developed some kind of um, avoidance mechanisms as a way of kind of uh, surviving with my psyche intact in school so like in school i would rebel against the curriculum by reading books under the table and so at some level to try to preserve my freedom or to preserve my autonomy, I would reject whatever was um, whatever instructions or directives I was given because most of them seem like bullshit. But the problem with that is when you make that a habit, it becomes like a like a subconscious habit, and so you just reject all directives and instructions. And so I even reject my own instructions. Instru so if like I write down I'm going to study today, I don't because like fuck instructions, right? Right. So so in, in so like in in my earlier life um, the the impulse that I, I would say it served me. It served me to preserve kind of my my sense of self and my sense of what I'm interested in and all that. But like um, I was overcorrecting, I guess, and I needed to dig into it and like inspect element and like unpack whatever was not helping me anymore. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. I wouldn't say I'm done with it, but I've made a lot of progress and um, yeah. it's, uh, it is what it is. Well, it seems like a lot of what drives you is almost making the complex visible yes so you can sure. say here's what it looks like it's way mm -hmm. more complex than you think and i imagine having that right. in the corporate world in school where there's a right answer or a right metric or one process right. uh, that's such a such a tension and i imagine probably what's driven you to kind of explore working on your own as well yeah true True. I think something I felt pretty early on was that if there is a problem that has already that already has a very very clear solution, I'm not very interested in working on it because, I, and I think intuitively I know that I'm not kind of um, suited for it. Like uh, my disposition and personality is not right for it. So like, and I and I have met people who are really good at that. And like yeah. you, you, so you give them you give them kind of a, a puzzle that's like a closed puzzle, and there's like a algorithm, like you know, a Rubik's cube kind of thing, where you follow the algorithm and you get it. And the the game is to get as good as possible at following the algorithm so you get it. 
I, 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 so I used to kind of um, overcorrect against that as well. I'd be like, oh, that's bullshit and totally nonsense. But now I'm like, okay, okay, there is that, you know, it's a, it's a way of, you know, it's, it's a field, it's a, it's a class of fields. And some people are good at that, like, you know, accountants and all those people, they're good at that. And, you know, the world needs people who are good at that. And I respect that now. <laughs> and, um, but I also know that I will never be, even if I work my absolute hardest, I will never be as good an accountant as someone, even let's say like my wife, like my wife is, I would say she's more like me than the average person, but she's also more kind of, um, technic, like, um, meticulous, I guess. And I, I will never be able to be in the top 10% of like meticulous people. I just can't do that. And so if I try to play that game, I will lose. And it's like, yeah. why would I work so hard and get so miserable to play a game that I'm not going to win, right? Like, I might as well try to go to the frontier and there, you know, at the frontier, um, my lack of meticulousness doesn't hurt me and my ability to kind of explore and change frames and change context, it serves me. And people who are kind of good accounting, rule book following types, they struggle there. So it's just, it's about finding the kind of the space in the spectrum where my strengths are good and my weaknesses are not bad. And so, yeah, so it's like frontier work, I guess. It seems like a big theme for you centers around the word nourish, which Mm -hmm. I see in when you're talking about nourishing ideas, nourishing friendships. What does that word mean to you? That's a great question. Um, So, and I would say that even the concept of nourishment, uh, I think is a very recent one for me. I mean, I can trace it. You can always trace back the like kind of little glimmers of it from early on. But um, I would say before I started work, and maybe like when I was a teenager, I was a very disagreeable teenager. Again, like, you know, I, I despise the system and, and the media and, and um, convention. And so I was, I would end, so I never set out to be a disagreeable person, but like when you care about that set of things, you will find that you're surrounded by other disagreeable people. <laughs> and then that's kind of right. the game that there's this sphere. Some people will say like, oh, most of Twitter is like this. And maybe that's true. But like, um, uh, and disagreeableness is not bad in of itself, but there is this environment or this context where people are so disagreeable to the point where it becomes um, combative or vindictive or just cruel and, and hurtful. And I, you know, I actually got pretty good at, th- at I wouldn't say thriving, but like um, I got pretty good at being in that space and and um, playing those games. So I, I used to spend time on many different forums and I've been in forums where you know, there are smart people and the dominant way of operating in those forums is to just dunk on each other and insult each other. And, and yeah. I get it. It's like, it's like um, those are kind of the agreed or socially agreed upon rules and everyone's just, everyone's mean to each other, but everyone knows to expect everyone else to be mean. And there's almost a certain camaraderie to it. And I can actually get in there and be a member of that and be okay with it. But I found that it didn't satisfy me in some level. Like I, I think I have before all of that, I was probably kind of um, a little bit sold on ideas from I would say you know really old stories, even even like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and and you know all these great stories. They all have I think some element of of nourishment. This idea of like friendship and and kinship and taking care of each other and you you pick up the guy who's down and you know I, I want to be I would rather be in that kind of yeah. mode or sphere. And I, I have so many stories about this sort of thing. Like uh, I've seen cases where people are having a disagreement that looks like it's going to be interesting and then it gets personal somewhere along the way and then people start fighting with each other, insulting each other. And it's not that I have a problem with people fighting, but like when they start getting personal, they, they deviate from what was originally interesting. There was like this Hacker News exchange in like 2013 about... Um, about finance and, and economics. And it was like, I was like really interested in like, oh, like how interest rates are affected by so and so. And then one guy was like, oh, read a newspaper you do eat or something. And then someone, then it's something. And I'm like, I want to read the rest of that. But now I have to see you guys in something. It's such a, it's such a sad right. uh, frame. And yeah. I just, I feel like, um, yeah, we could, that, that it isn't necessary to be that way. And, you know, so here we get into kind of a, 
there's like this false dichotomy that either you have like this bar fight, street fight, everything all no holes barred, everything goes vicious thing, or you have like this really coddling, precious place where like everyone's feelings must be protected and you can't say anything. Um, you know, and I didn't realize how bad this can be as well. Cause like where I'm from, I don't have that kind of environment, but I have discovered that there's like this, this overly coddlesome safe space idea where, you know, no one's allowed to hurt anyone's feelings and no one's allowed to say anything contentious. So that's also bad. But like, I feel like there's this middle ground where, you know, like a, like a dojo where like, you know, you train each other and you challenge each other and then you pick each other up when you're down. And then the, the point is so that you can keep going, right? It's not that I want to be, it's not that I'm against um, bar fight kind of street fight scenes and I'm for like you know nursery coddlesome like I don't like either I just want to see progress and like it feels obvious to me that to have progress you need it's like strength training right you need to lift hard and then you need to rest you can't not rest and you can't not lift like, you have to do both and so I and when I kind of step back and look at the big picture I feel like um, you know like we already kind of fetishize strength and we fetishize intelligence, but I think sensitivity and kind of um, like like emotional resonance that's still kind of framed as weakness. And so I'm kind of throwing my my weight behind that. I feel like uh, that's that's the kind of the hole in the sh- in the boat, right? That is the leak that we we don't get to have conversations as long as we would otherwise because people get tired because we aren't sufficiently nourishing. I love that. And I think it's something I've thought a lot about. I mean, I think especially for men, there's a tendency Mm -hmm. to kind of be a little more combative when you're younger and kind of compete over ideas and be right. Um, I've always, always a little more analytical. So when somebody would say something, it's like, obviously not true. It's like, no, you're Mm -hmm. wrong. But then I think over time you realize, well, you actually have to keep hanging out with this person and <laughs> there's like a deeper hard to name aspect of that. And I think that's where I love the word nourish. It kind right. of evokes a more emotional, like, Oh, that's kind of mm-hmm. nice. And I experience it with podcasts. I think mm-hmm. having these kind of conversations, I walk away and say, Oh wow, that was kind of fulfilling to kind of do nice. that. Um, and you wrote, you wrote a little about this. I was reading one of your posts about the tension between intellect and right. kindness, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. there's tremendous benefits to being intellectual. However, the dark side to that is the drive to like have to be right, right? Mm-hmm. It's like placing the um, rightness over the value of the relationship, which it's easy to measure who's right, but it's harder to measure nourishment in that connection right and i one way that i kind of synthesize this is um i still want to be right you know it's not like i've <laughs> given up given up like oh logic you know it's out the window it, i think how i'm framing it now is again I, and i've accumulated so many kind of um unfortunate and sad experiences where you know i had a friend and then we had a difficult conversation and i was i came on too strongly and then like we're not really close anymore and like ah like if i had just known when to quit in that one particular conversation for example then we could keep talking and then like i would make progress so it's about it's really about kind of expanding your frame of how so i still want to be right but i don't need to be right right now i need to kind of win people over over a long term so if you're willing to it's it's really you know if you need to see if you need to get the person to see your point of view today that's that that limits your options but if you're willing to, you know what, you're not going to get this this month, this year, because, you know, you have your context and your background and I have mine. And like for you to see my perspective, you need to understand where I'm coming from. I need to understand where you're coming from. And that's going to take, you know, years. I'm, I've, I have, there are people I have been following for years who, you know, we don't entirely see eye to eye on everything. But like, and it's nice. It's nice to, when you say I'm willing to have this conversation for years, which sounds crazy to some people. But once you've experienced it, it sounds crazy to me that you don't do this. Which is, yeah, it's just, you know, kind of this open-ended, long-term conversation. And maybe in, like, a couple of years, I might change my mind about my position, you know. So it's uh, just by by willing to kind of pull out the time frame longer, everything becomes kind of more more flexible, more interesting, less combative. Yeah, I've been fascinated with how this has evolved on Twitter. It seems to be just this 
or at least a certain subgroup of people. I think uh, Anna Gott has called it the interintellect, right? And yeah. it's this group of curious humans who I think uh, you're probably a really good reflection of this group. And mm-hmm. it's just somebody that is not most excited about right versus left, right versus wrong. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. uh, let's dance with some interesting, yeah. complex ideas and exactly. see what it spurs in us, right? It's uh, mm-hmm. what do you make of this group? I mean, so I, I actually met Anna in like uh, in April to May. We both went to San Francisco at the same time. We coordinated our trips. And yeah, it was a wonderful experience. So I was living in a house with... Uh, Mason and who's uh, web dev Mason and Anna who's um, and it was just you know Anna's from Budapest I'm from Singapore and uh, Mason's from the States and we're all just kind of in the same room and you know we're, we're so different like we all grew up in different parts of the planet but like we all had the same kind of nerdy philosophy philosophy adjacent curiosities um, you know um I think one thing we all have in common is a kind of, um, a, so I mean, I'm projecting when I say we all have a long view, but I think it's true. I think it's, we all have, uh, again, pe- pe- I think people get caught up in like superficial differences when you're kind of face to face with each other and you don't have uh, common interests. Um, I'm, I'm spiraling. Like, but like, uh, so I know that, okay, well, a thing that I remember thinking when I was there was like, oh, wow, this, this is a little taste of what it must have been like in a, in a coffee shop in Vienna during like the Freud era. So that's, are, you, are you familiar with this? Like in the 1600s, I think, like all the, like the Western intellectual world would congregate around like Vienna coffee shops. And like you could go into a coffee shop and there's like, like, the, like several people who are the best in their fields on different in different spheres are all at the same coffee shop and how wonderful the that atmosphere must have been and i feel like we got a taste of it like you know like um, mason's passionate about education i'm passionate about everything and uh it just it just felt like um it would be so nice to have more like a more diverse group of people with that same kind of spirit and and I think we're doing it. I think we we knew that we we test we kind of our experience showed us that it's possible to have people like that from around the world come together. And I think so. I think it's all there has always been that group of people. You know. So I, I very recently tweeted about uh, this this kind of mental picture I have, which is um, libraries as kind of. Um, the church to the light of human consciousness where, you know, so there are libraries around the world with books written by people over hundreds of years and, you know, from Seneca and, and Socrates and, and just all these generations, like there's this, there's this line of, of people who have been interested in kind of the cultural and philosophical and, and how are you going to frame it? Just kind of people who feel like, they have a responsibility to kind of take the species forward. Like not just to think about, Oh, you know, I have, I have bills to pay. I have, uh, you know, I need to make sure my kids go to school. Like there's that. And then there's also kind of, you know, what is our species? What is our place in the, in the world? Right. What what is the future of, of humanity? How, what, what can we be excited about? What, like that kind of big picture thinking, I think there have always been people who do that. And, the moment I learned that there were people like that, even in the past, I, I knew that I wanted to be a part of that myself. And I think when I met Anna and Mason, I, I saw it in them that they want to be a part of that as well. And I don't know if there are many people that I've met before that who I felt shared that same feeling with that degree of intensity. I think there are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of people who are kind of like tourists in the space of, um, in this space, right? Which isn't a bad thing. Like, you know, um, sometimes people are at different stages of their journey and they might, some people might want to just get a sense of it and then go back to their lives. Or some people want to try it for a while and they need to try it for a few years before they're like, okay, this is what my life is going to be about. And some of us, we re-architect our entire lives to say, we're going to do this 
ride or die, right? And um, and yeah, uh, for me, just having witnessed this and participated in it, I, I want to help as much as I can. I want to find everyone else. You know, I tell people like like my job. So I remember like on a, in the last couple of days together, we were like, uh, okay, we got to make sure this this still happens. Like uh, Anna's like, okay, I'm gonna make a, a, a website and and gather people. And Mason's like, okay, I'm gonna have a chapel and host events. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go and find all the really obscure like people in in South America and Africa and like you know find those people and, and bring them together. And so there's this sense of of urgency and and mission, which is really exciting. It's like purposeful. And yeah, I mean, so you ask, what do I think about it? It's just, I, I, I love it. I think that it's great. It, it makes me, you know, to, it sounds dramatic to say it, but it makes me happier to be alive even, right? Just knowing that people yeah. are doing this. Because if nobody is doing it, then it's like, what, are, what is life, right? Like we're just, we're just paying the bills and, and eating food and watching a bit of Netflix and then we die, right? It's just kind of, there should be something to, to, to be excited about, to to make the struggle worthwhile. Yeah, it's a fascinating space. And I like what you said too about like, there's almost like digital tourists who will pop into mm-hmm. these communities online, check it out, and then go back to their uh, venture raising life or something. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And it's been amazing to see like, oh, there are other people like me. I've, mm-hmm. I sense this too. I tell people, people ask me my goals and I say, mm-hmm. well, my goals are to make a lot of friends. So when I'm older, mm-hmm. I have people to hang out with. Yeah. And, pe- and people are like, no, like, I mean, how much money are you trying to make <laughs> in the next quarter? It's like, no, like everything I do is right. geared around friendship. And then if I find stuff, I can make money along the way. Fantastic. Right. And for me, a big influence is this book you read when you're younger, Tuesdays with Maury. Oh, I read that. Yeah. And he's basically a guy who has all friends just visiting him as he's older. And it's like, I always just had this idea of, wouldn't that be kind of cool? So maybe we can live on the same street uh, okay. or same digital street. Who knows what the world yeah. will look like? Yeah. Uh, and you know, a- another thing is I often, so I have riffs for utilitarians. So, I mean, so there's this, there's this very narrow utilitarianism, which is like, um, how can we maximize profit this quarter, right? Or how can we be, you know, what's the greatest amount of value I can create now? And what I always, I like to play with these people. I like to remind them that, you know, so what's like, what's the most valuable company in the world right now? Like Apple, probably, you know, you know like a, a, almost a trillion dollar company. And, yeah. you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they didn't meet and say, Let's start the most valuable company in the world, right? So they they were pranksters. They were they were they were clowning around. And Steve Jobs said that you know they used to do this thing called blue boxing. Are you familiar? So what they would do is they would like there was a way to kind of hack telephone systems back then, right? And the thing they weren't they weren't doing that to make a profit. They were doing that to screw around, right? They were like, oh, let's just you know it'll be fun. Let's call the Pope, you know, let's have fun. And Steve Jobs said if it was the experience of being able to kind of leverage billions of dollars of uh, telephone infrastructure that made them realize that they could play with that. And then they made Apple. And, and, and it's just, you know, I feel like a lot of people are saying, let's start Apple, but they aren't saying, let's fuck around and make and, and call the Pope, right? And you have to do the fucking around to make the Apple. That's the, that's the thing that, you know, I feel that people miss. It's the screwing around and having fun. And so like Richard Feynman has a quote about how, so he was trying, he was like being paid to solve some problem that he didn't find very interesting. And he was like in a rut. And then he was like at a cafeteria and he was just sitting around like, ah, I, I, I love physics, but why am I so bored? And then he sees some guy spinning a tray in the cafeteria. And he's like, hmm, why is it that when the tray is spinning, the outside seems like it's spinning faster than the inside? And then he's like, hmm, let, let, let's think about it. That sounds interesting. And then he starts writing equations and everything. And he eventually wins the Nobel Prize for like the consequences of the equations that he was doing then. And, you know, when he showed it to his colleagues. They're like, okay, but what's the point? Like, who, what's, what's the point of this? And he's like, I don't know. It's interesting. Let's just see where it goes. Right. And so like, I think what a bunch of us do is almost give people permission by example to just explore the crazy stuff. And again, it's the, it's all, all like the penicillin was discovered by accident. Like these people are so, so my criticism of utilitarianism is not what you're doing is wrong, but like 
the way you are doing what you're doing is not the way to get what you want. Like the way to get what you want is to go and explore unknown territory and and find interesting things, and that's how you make a mid. And I, yeah, the point is not I want a Nobel Prize, therefore I'm gonna. The point is to just alert, get yourself alert to whatever it is that's interesting around you. I love that. Another thing you write is about friendship. It's dangerous mm-hmm. to go it alone. So why yes. is it dangerous to go alone? Well, I mean, that, so that's a quote from Zelda. Have you played Zelda? <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. So there's the early on. It's just it's dangerous to go alone and take the sword. But you know, humans are extremely social creatures to a degree that I think modern society has almost hidden from us. In a, in a, so a, a, I would recommend anybody who's curious about this to read um, Tribe by Sebastian Younger. I have a thread about it. And basically, you know, so the thing about modern capitalism is that it makes, you know, it's so cheap to get food. So you can, so it used to be that if you want to eat, you got to go and find the food and you can't really do it alone. Like you need to go hunting with a group or whatever. And, you know, you share the, the spoils of your you, you hunt a deer and you can't do it alone. And like today you might not get a deer and your friend might get a deer. And so, you know, you kind of, you invariably depend on each other to survive. And that's just like one tiny fragment of, of the way in which people are social. And, you know, um, what else? There's just so many things about people who are tightly knit. So like uh, there's a bunch of stuff that Sebastian Younger talks about. It's like um, you would expect disasters to be like miserable experiences but like repeatedly when people study what happens after natural disasters like people get closer to each other because they need to depend on each other there's like no electricity there's like no i need to share food and people need to really pay attention to each other and care for each other and everybody tends to say like oh wow i miss you know there are people from like the london who are saying that i miss the bombings because we were so close to each other back then it's the same thing with nine eleven in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it it's it's so sad that we need all these threats and external things to to bring us together because you know ultimately we're all gonna die, right? So we are all. So like there's this there's this study about LSD for like uh, using LSD as therapy for terminal cancer patients, and then right. the, the the doctor was like, you know, we're all terminal, right? It's just those guys are closer to it than the rest of us, but we're all terminal so you know we all need it in a sense like we all need that you know that's why we have art and why we have uh, the, the point of art is to give people a common thing to to share their emotional resonance and it's just it's just to me it's become obvious that this is just a very fundamental human need that we have almost we've almost screwed ourselves a little bit by in the age of abundance we have uh, you know everything is so so i think one of the quotes from sebastian is um men men do not mind hardship in fact they thrive on it what they mind what they struggle with is not being needed and modern society has perfected the art of making people not be needed right because again like you can if you are hungry you can just buy some cheap stuff from wherever so you don't need to you don't need to cooperate with someone else to whatever and then just loneliness is kind of the so we the the grand irony is that we are more connected than ever and we are lonelier than ever which is yeah. so sad because you know there's so many people and there's so many people who are lonely and just all the beautiful things come out of um social connection and and kinship and and so what was your question again about loneliness yeah i just i feel i feel that why it's dangerous to go it alone well, yeah. So we know that lon- we know that loneliness kills people. Like lonely, and you know, it's just uh, it not only kill. And it, 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 a person shouldn't have to kill themselves for us to say that being lonely is terrible, right? It's just you know, uh, you know, they're all right now. There are millions of like elderly people around the world who are like living in alone in their houses, and they haven't seen anybody in months. It's really sad. And and they're also you know teenager like this so there's something about modern civilization that atomizes people it's and even in school right like you're trained to study for a standardized test and like nobody does standardized tests in in life like in like the, <laughs> the first thing you do is you col- right. you you collaborate to build stuff together right? whether it's a company or you want to make a band or whatever it is you want to do all the interesting stuff that you can do is stuff that you collaborate with other people because then you go beyond your mind into somebody else's mind you know, and like all the great partnerships like, uh, you know, Lennon, McCartney and, and Excel and Slash, whatever. It's just 
partnerships and peers and and scenes like these are all obviously the beautiful things about humanity but like we raise you know we have like nuclear families and we raise kids to study for standardized tests and just people have come to to think of themselves in atomized ways which is clearly not good for health right it clearly yeah. makes people neurotic and upset and and uh so it is dangerous to go alone it it, it, it you lose you lose a sense of proportion i think I th- like so even, even like I, I pointed out at some point um like the danger of a n- very very nuclear family for example so if it's just mom and dad and child and there's no grand there's no grandpa there's no aunt there's no cousins is you then then in that relationship like all of the parents anxieties are projected onto the child and all the child's like rebellious stuff is projected against the parents and just there's no there's no context for like if one party is being unreasonable you can't you can't resolve it within that context. You need to you need an aunt or a sister or somebody else to say, hey, like you know, like parents are being unreasonable or the child is being unreasonable. Like you need you need a village, right, to yeah. mediate everything. Yeah, there's a great Vonnegut quote about that where he says, "You're not enough people." Exactly, and exactly he, that. Yeah, he's like yeah. people are just screaming. It's basically because there's not enough people. And he talks about this family that has like a hundred cousins. Like, how cool would it be to be that baby growing up in that family? Exactly. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting too coming from the U.S. where so much for like my idea of success growing up mm-hmm. all had to do with independence, right? Mm-hmm. Like success is literally having a huge house Mm -hmm. and nobody says like well you have a bunch of empty rooms isn't that sad right right yeah i've always thought about this it's like so many people have empty rooms like and that's kind of one of my goals is if i have rooms i'd like to fill them or leave them open right that's great that's Um, beautiful to people to have Uh, i only have a one bedroom apartment right now but i have a lovely couch um but yeah, it's uh, and I was listening to a Hidden Brain episode today about uh, the loneliness challenges, and they were doing this uh, experiment where they were saying, "What do you think will give you the most joy? Mm-hmm. Sitting on a train in solitude, um, doing an activity, or talking to somebody?" Right? And people were like, "Well, I don't want to talk to strangers." And the funny thing was. Like a hundred percent of people are like, yeah, I'd talk to somebody on the train. Mm-hmm. And then when you judge people's like enjoyment level of that, they all enjoy the conversation the most afterwards. Uh, so it's this disconnect of thinking nobody wants to talk to us. And I almost mm-hmm. think like our scales are too big. So I'd love to bring that back to mm-hmm. digital communities in which right. like I've seen the friction to connecting with somebody is really low. Like it didn't take much for us to jump on a podcast. Uh, right. I've jumped on the phone with people after 10 minutes, just like jamming right. about an idea. Do you think there's a shadow side to this um, um, of being connected digitally and the fact that we're all at our computers instead of in person? No. So I actually have a, I have a whole bunch of stuff to say about this. Um, well, so first of all, I, so one of my other themes, so I, did, I don't include this in my mission because that's a bit, antagonistic but like one of a major theme of my life work of my life's work i think is is what i call how do we coordinate to address the asshole problem which is <laughs> it's 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 connected right because i love it yeah like there's a bunch of studies and there's a bunch of and just just letting talking to people about this everyone's like oh yeah that's true which is one percent of people cause like 70 to 80 percent of all social problems and like you know so they're the disagreeable people they're the people they're like unreasonable customers you know, angry, traumatized people. Like, which is, I'm not, I'm not trying. To, I'm not judging people for behaving badly. But the point is that, like, one percent of people behave in ways that are damaging to society, to communities, or to spaces. And like, the mere existence of bad actors makes good actors suspicious of each other. Because we, if we, if we passed each other on the street, if we passed each other on the street, and we don't know anything about each other. Each of us is going to have to worry that, oh, there's like a couple of percent chance that this guy might be an asshole, right? So as long as there are some bad actors in a market, everybody else has to worry that everybody else might be a bad actor. And the reason that, you know, we can like kind of hop on podcasts and stuff very easily with each other is because we can verify each other's background. We can look at each other's 
tweets or blog posts or whatever. And like, oh, this guy cares about these things, and you 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 now can sense. You know, so what might be cool is in, if in the future you could kind of have like an AR something floating around you that you know, it's a, if if you go into it like a train or whatever. And you can see each person's kind of mission floating above your head. It's much easier to strike up random conversation, right? So the worry again, like with ra- with random stranger talking, is that you worry that oh, this person's gonna sell me something, or this person's a creep and he's gonna waste my time, or he's gonna ask me for money, or he's gonna, you know, all those things. And which is why I find I- I've asked a bunch of friends, and everyone says this is true. Uh, if you travel. Like the odds of people randomly being nice to you when you're visibly a traveler is much higher. Everyone's nice to travelers because you know that, that you can see that that guy is oh he's a visitor he doesn't know what's going on and if he comes to you for help you're like oh let me help you right like this because you you're pretty convinced that this person is unlikely to be a bad actor right and so like people underestimate how much damage um, a few bad actors cause because it's not just what they do it's like the potential of what they might do. And okay, circling to your question about uh, is it bad that we are on our computers and phones all the time? I don't think it's that bad actually, but I'm com- I'm speaking from my frame where I'm very intentional about what I want, and uh, you know I'm looking for friends. I'm willing to, you know, I know how I'm going to handle like angry or disagreeable people. So as long as I'm always looking for friends, every conversation, you know. So now I I feel like after this, either of us knows that if either of us visits, if you come to Singapore, if I come to Taipei, we have a friend, you know. You know, and that's that's like such an amazing use of time. It's like you're creating. It's real wealth. You know, wealth is options, is possibilities, is being able to go to. I I, I can actually say now that. You know, I'm not rich or anything, but like I can go to most major cities, and there will be people who want to show me around, which is amazing. It's like you know, you have, if like you have people way wealthier than me don't have that option because you know they don't have friends there, so they have to pay a tour guide. And again, you pay a tour guide, he he'll show you around, but he's not your friend. You know, he's not gonna. It's not. It's not the same. You can't. You can't cheat this. And so, for me, I I don't really i don't personally see the downsides but again when people talk to me about it i'm like oh you know so like we're both guys and like uh you know women tend to endure a whole lot more bullshit from internet strangers than we do so that's a whole other thing that um you know it's it's not in this conversation but it's a thing that exists that people have to work and again it's you know i I feel like it's all related to the asshole problem (laughs) that needs oh yeah uh, for sure addressing yeah, yeah I, th- I think the asshole problem is probably the synthesis of why I ended up leaving the corporate world. And hmm. it just, it's a lot of, uh, you're always carrying around this like on guard personality, right? Because right. I knew who some of those people were, but you don't know if everyone is, right? And who's going to... Right, and once there are a few bad actors and they seem to always win, like then everyone yeah. else is like, I want, I want to be a good actor, but I they can't always trust... Won. <laughs> Right, yeah, and then you, I can't trust that being a good actor will not be taken advantage of. So the people who want to be good actors end up kind of, you know, unhappily becoming slightly bad actors. You know, kind of, you know, like if I don't kind of cover my ass, someone else is gonna take my 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 pie or whatever. And yeah, so that's the that's the great thing about kind of striking it out and going into the wilderness because everywhere that is kind of a Every high, so yesterday I was watching a Netflix show about like uh, avocados in and like there's like an avocado cartel and like organized crime around. So basically, anywhere there's like something becomes extremely profitable, whether it's drugs or avocados or whatever it is, maple syrup in Canada and and whatnot. When something becomes very very profitable, it attracts you know like rent seekers and and organized crime and and people who decide unethical people who decide that they don't care what happens as long as they can extract value. And so um, if you care about kind of having, I mean, this is, that this is a huge thing to talk about, but I guess uh, what I'm saying is if you don't want to hang out with that kind of people, one of the fastest ways to do it is to just kind of go, I, I, I describe it as just going away from that. And, and um, examples I would give is like anything that's difficult to do without immediate and obvious rewards has some of the best people around. So like I witnessed this when I went like scuba diving in, in Thailand. I'm I can't I can barely swim and I can't scuba dive. But I went on a scuba diving kind of like a like a intro beginner's course kind of thing. And at some point like you know so you gotta take this small little boat out to the big boat and then you get in the big boat and you go out to sea. 
And then like halfway while I'm at sea, I realize, oh shit, I'm like in the oceans of Thailand. My phone doesn't work. Um, if there is an emergency, like I don't even know if like how, what's gonna happen. Like if someone has like a heart attack, right? Like how are you gonna get back to it? like you know you, you suddenly realize it's like twenty people on the boat, like instructors and and like whatever, and like you suddenly feel like oh we're all really dependent on each other now. Like there's a limited amount of food, limited amount of water, so everyone has to take care of everyone else, and it it feels great. It feels very intimate, and also you realize that like. And you just feel like everyone here is nice. Like no one here, no one came here to take advantage of other people. Like there's, there's nothing to be taken advantage of. So anybody who, anybody who made this perilous journey all the way out there, and I'm sure the same is true for. So I, in Singapore, you have to serve. If you're a Singaporean citizen, you have to serve in the military. And so I was like a support staff to like special forces for a while. So I wasn't in special forces, but I was like their water boy, right? And I got to witness how the special forces operate, and it's beautiful. It's like it's just. There's amazing camaraderie. Every, it's a very, very high trust environment. Everyone takes care of each other. Like, um, people have ranks, but they don't care about the rank. Like, a lower ranking guy can kind of tell a higher ranking guy, hey, I think we should do this. And they would, like, listen. And again, the reason there's such a high trust environment, I think, is because, first of all, it's so difficult to get into the special forces. So, like, anybody who went, who is in there, like, they spent, like, a decade of their life working towards getting in there, right? So, it's a, you can trust that. No one is there to like make a quick buck or like no one is there to try and be a, a career politician kind of guy. And yeah, I'm always curious to see this dynamic play out in kind of high trust environments versus low trust environments. How can we make our immediate environments higher trust? You know, what can we do to... So, and again, like, so I, I think to both of us, it's obvious that we both like to operate, you know, in where we can trust the other person. I guess for some people, that's not true. I guess for some people, they're like, just, I don't know, maybe they grew up Machiavellian, I don't know. It's, uh, it's just, it's, I, I don't know how curious I am about understanding the minds of people who don't relate because it's a full-time job just finding the other people yeah. who relate, right? So You have to build this idea. Mm -hmm. um, so Buster from Twitter asks, yeah. He wanted you to perform your top five tweet threads as a rap or dance. Uh, I don't think I can do that. But. <laughs> this might be a good uh, transition. I was going to shoot you some like rapid fire questions about oh, some sure. of your threads. Sure. Um, so maybe similar to like what Tyler Cowen does with his guests. So mo most overrated thread. Ah. Uh. Hmm. You can pass. Uh, no, I, I like to try and answer. I think probably my uh, um, most overrated thread. This, I mean, I, so my most popular thread of all time is just a series of screenshots I took from um, a subreddit called Boring Dystopia. And, you know, so sometimes I make threads of screenshots and it's just for my own reference. And this is one of those. I just wanted to, a reference of screenshot ideas and it has like i think fifty thousand retweets or something and so i i it's a little bit humbling that you know <laughs> like people care so much about i mean it's 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 funny because i didn't make take those pictures i just i just copy pasted them so it's not mine it's not my work i just did yeah. it. and uh you know but is it overrated i mean it helped a lot of people see things that they might not have seen before so you know it's it's it it went more viral than it I don't know. It's messy. I, it's, it's it depends on how you frame it. Yeah. What about most underrated thread? Uh, hmm. I I have a bunch, but the the slightly sad thing is that if a thread doesn't get much attention, it's easy to forget it after a while. Ah, but yeah. I think I have I have some old threads where I kind of talk about. Um, I have some really old threads from like I mean not like a couple of years old threads about like just my feelings and uh, and thinking about... Uh, so I, I think I have some threads from earlier on where I was very uh, intimate about my feelings of like uncertainty or and things like that. And like no one really noticed at the time. So I may retweet some of those things. And so I, I have, I think I did have a thread about like uh, masculinity when I, in like 2017 when I had fewer followers and like nobody, nobody really saw that. So that's pretty underrated. Um, what about weirdest thread? 
Oh, I have so many weird threads. I have one where <laughs> I have one where I just um, like so I do a search for myself with like ha and like ha ha and ha 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 and just just to see all of the instances in which I have done that. That's just weird. Why did I do that? I don't know. I just felt like doing it, and it's a it's a weird collection of the amount of h a h a's I type out, and uh, I learned nothing from it. It's just uh, one of those things that. I do because the idea came into my head and I did it. And I'm glad that I do weird things like that, but there's there's nothing that comes out of it except the willingness to just do pointless things. Best Twitter tip you'd have for somebody that's maybe using it passively, maybe lurking, or wants to get more into using Twitter? Um, right. So the first thing I would say is um, don't bother following like institutions. Don't bother following like you know CNN or any like like you should use Twitter to follow other people because if you're if you're following it for like news, even celebrity news or whatever, if it's really interesting, like regular people will retweet it as well and it'll come on your feed. So don't bother following uh, institutions and and companies and stuff. And then I would also say don't bother following anybody who isn't likely to reply to your replies so i would not bother following anybody with like over a couple of thousand followers and for, when you're starting out when you're starting out i would only follow people who have like a thousand ish followers two thousand ish followers because then they're likelier to reply and ideally they are not following too many people so that you, you want to optimize for replies you want to have conversations as as much as you can and as quickly as you can and then once you have a few conversations with people and they like you and they follow you back then you want to make friends with their friends right so it's really it's really this very relationship driven model of of twitter so you're not there to post i mean you're not there to read the news or to be up to date on gossip or whatever but really just to say like make friends with people so we did a whole podcast about work and somehow didn't talk about work Maybe talk to me about your self-employment journey and leaping in the past year or so. Right. So, I mean, so I, I want to mention a, a thread that I have that I thought was pretty good, which is uh, I say um, step one is to do unpaid work for yourself. And then step two is to use those assets to negotiate paid work for someone else that, you know, gets the bills paid. And then step three is you save up as much as you can so that you then have the leeway, the freedom to do higher quality unpaid work for yourself. And then after that, you kind of, uh, in my tweet, I said, step four, we'll see. But uh, I'm kind of in step four right now, which is, you know, so, so this is kind of about a, a kind of sideways look at the whole, should you do unpaid work question? So I would, you know, I don't like, so I personally have always paid anybody who's done work for me because I can't respect myself or respect anybody else who demands free work from people. So that's kind of a, you know, but like, so if you're going to do unpaid work, like, and so that's kind of so the, 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 the divide, right? Like, should you do unpaid work for other people? Like, if you're going to do unpaid work, you should do it for yourself because you are the person who will benefit. You are like, it's like, it's like, you know, you, you're doing the labor of writing a blog post or whatever, and it creates capital, and that capital should be yours, right? So that you can use that to get better work subsequently. So that's what I've been doing. So like when I started out, I was just kind of blogging for myself, and I got a job to do marketing because my boss saw my blog and he, he believed correctly that this guy can probably like be pivoted into a software marketing role. And then... Um, yeah, and so when I left my job, I spent like a year tweeting aggressively and that was like my unpaid work for myself. And then through that, I find all these interesting opportunities that will then get me the next work. So I think, yeah, I, I think that's the thought I would like to leave people with, which is that you can work for yourself. Like you, you can do unpaid work for yourself. And I suggest doing anything that you find interesting. So even, you know, one of my most popular essays of all time is an essay I wrote about Mean Girls, the movie. Like I watched the movie, I was like, "Holy shit!" Th this reminds me of this like shitty friend that I used to have, who was really smart but really manipulative. And anyway, I, I wrote an essay called uh, "The The Power and Social Dynamics in Mean Girls," and it went super viral. And like, I, it's funny because you know it got the attention of people, kind of like 
layers above my my pay grade. Like uh, I think F. Williams retweeted it, and like uh, a bunch of people who I would not have met otherwise retweeted it. And even so, I was working in tech, and like if I had sent those people an email about like um, hey check out this tech thing, they would be like ah, I don't care, right? But because it's an essay about a movie and that they cared about, they read it, and then. Now I have like this, I wouldn't say I have a relationship with them, but I have like this opening thing. Like, hey, remember you, you shared that essay? I wrote it and like, I want to chat about something. And so, I, I, again, I, and this goes back also to like the Apple thing with the with the hacking of the telephones and stuff. Like, do the telephone hacking work that you want to do. Like, whatever it is that, you know, like, so sometimes people say things like, oh, nobody wants to read that. But like, you are a person, you are a body, right? Yeah. So if you want to read it, if you want to read it, then somebody else wants to read it. Because you're not you're not so special that nobody else cares about what you care about. So find the thing that you really care about and write the essay or make the video or do the podcast or whatever that you think is you have to think that it's exciting. And in fact, so the trap some people fall into is they think that they need to do what they think other people will be interested in. And right. that's that's like guesswork, right? You're guessing that someone else will care about this. And your guesswork is probably off by some degree that you don't realize. Whereas if you do something that you care about and you personally laugh at your own joke, but like you have to laugh at your own joke. You have to make the joke that you think is funny. Once you do that, then you're guaranteed that someone else will also find it funny and you have to share that. And if you do that in your spare time, then that and the amazing thing about the internet is if you publish stuff on your website or whatever, people can find it in the future. And you can reshare it in the future. Like, so the thing that I'm known for is I keep sharing old threads, <laughs> whatever. And it's just, yeah, it's like I did the work in the past and I can share it now. And like people are like, oh, it's amazing how you do that. Anybody can do that. It's just, and the, the trick is you have to care about it, right? So if, you, if, you, if I wrote stuff that I don't care about, then I won't remember it. But if it's something that I care about, then I'm like, oh, I remember having strong feelings about this and I wrote about it. So here's the relevant thing. And you just keep doing that and like opportunities come. Like it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, I love that framing. It's very much the approach I've happened into. It's mm -hmm. nice. I basically just always had stuff I wanted to create. And then after enough time, you start meeting people who are like, hey, this stuff you're creating is cool. Yeah. They, they then basically tell you what to create next. Right. Yes. yes. With their questions. And then uh, it's like, well, I don't really think about what I'm doing. I just know I'm going to get enough signs or questions yeah. or inquiries or, uh, so it, it have this kind of loop and you can't really tell someone here are the mm -hmm. 10 steps to get there. Though I do yeah. love your four steps. Um, right. the four, <laughs> the, the four step could be that meme from, uh, South Park, like get underpants question mark profit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is a, so, right. There is an element of faith. Right. In, you know, and, and the way, you know, I, I get, I'm personally dramatic about it, which is kind of like a, again, when I was in school, I remember thinking there must be people like me. The world is too big for there <laughs> to not be people like me. And so there must be, you know, like in the, there must be like a dozen wealthy visas out there, right. Who, if they saw me, so they don't see me right now, but if they saw me, they would be like, Hey, that's one of me. And I'm going to help that kid because he's like me, right? And because that's what I would do in their shoes. Like if, if I see a kid that's like me, I would want to help that kid. And so I, I made a leap of faith basically with the belief that those people must exist. And like to be dramatic about it, if they don't exist, then I'll just die. <laughs> like you know, like, like if, if there are no people out there who care about me the way I am, then like why bother, right? And wonderfully, like, you know, there's billions of people in the world. So there are thousands of people who care about you. Yeah, that's so, uh, I think it's deeper than people may realize. That idea around yeah. faith is people frame the decision I've made in terms of, oh, well, what do you do without a paycheck? Mm -hmm. Right. And right. For me, it's the same thing. It's about finding the other people that want to go on a weird journey with me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you yeah. can't quantify that. You can't convince right. somebody that's quantifying it yeah. that it can be something yeah. you can believe in. But it really is about faith. And when it comes down to it, I don't really know what my future look like, looks like. I just know it feels... I have, I have faith, right? That's the word. Right. I yeah. have faith that it's headed towards something. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've done, so I've done the reading, right? So 
if you've read about pioneers and uh, you know voyages and whatever, like people have been doing this for millennia, right? And you know sometimes people say things like, oh, you know the stars, like I was born too late to sail the oceans and too early to to explore the stars. And I'm like, sure, but like your everyday life is something that can be a exploration, right? You can just try crazy shit in your own life. Yeah, I pulled up a quote because it reminded me of something from Alan Watts. He says, belief, oh, nice. cling, belief clings, but faith lets go. Nice. I love Alan Watts. So like around 2014, 2015, I was like depressed. And I was depressed because I was, you know, I had everything that I dreamed of as a child. That You know, like, so when I was a child, I was like, oh, I hope someday somebody will pay me for what I do. And like I had it like in 2013, I was ma- I was married to my wife who I love very much. I had my own place away from my family, which was like a precious space. Like everything about my life was on paper great, but I was just miserable anyway because I think it felt it felt like existence itself was like a jail sentence somehow. Like uh, you know I was going to work every m- I was waking up every morning, taking the bus and then the train and going to work. And you know I love my colleagues, but you know we have our uh, weekly meetings and just everything just felt monotonous and I'm like is this as good as it gets and is this what my life is going to be like for the next 50 years and am I and, and, I'm, and I'm one of the lucky ones right to be you know born in the, the developed world and to have my health and to have all those things and yet it seemed like the prospect of my life was just a jail sentence in a way and that I just felt so miserable and then um, I ended up listening to a bunch of Alan Watts on YouTube and he I feel like what he showed me was that it can be funny. Like it can like it, it like you, I was taking things too seriously and like I was I was like kind of all tensed up and 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 anxious and and worried. But he kind of helped me see that you know if you let go and kind of laugh about it and see the humor in it and you know like look for the light in the in the cracks. So like Leonard Cohen has a has a quote that's like you know there's a crack in everything that's how the light gets in, right? They, they kind of if you don't be so tense, if you let yourself be playful, if you let go of like this anxious need to make everything perfect or whatever, then you can kind of find the the laughter and the light in the in the spaces. And then it becomes, then you realize, ah, oh, it's alright. You know, it's it's I I don't have to agonize and I don't have to worry about oh 50, I can't predict the future and like you know. And I remember I used to because I. I was go, every day I would go home after work and I would be you know it's kind of it, like I would take the same commute for five and a half years so every and every day I would not every day but like every once in a while I'll be like this is me doing the same I'm putting on my headphones listening to music walking to the train station and I'm like this feels relentless but one day will be the last day I do this right and then I will look back on it and be like huh you know that those were the days right and just kind of that and then there's something Alan Wattsy about that realization, and, and it made me kind of it, it gave me a lightness, which, you know, which isn't like it's not like I don't have bills to pay anymore, or I don't have. I mean, so right now, so it's funny because um, sometimes in my current kind of um, free agent life, I sometimes think, oh man, I'm worried about you know the bills or like my clients or whatever, and like there was a time where I was living a paycheck life and feeling kind of unfulfilled or kind of um you know like uh i mean i was ha- I, I wouldn't say unfulfilled but like i remember feeling restless. kind of lethar- lethargic and restless at the same time like i'm i'm kind of tired of that and i wish i had i i, I would yearn then for what i have now and now that i'm here you know there's like i mean i don't I, I don't yearn for back then anymore but like it's just funny to realize that there's struggle in every kind of context. So I was struggling in a certain way when I was in at work, and now I'm struggling a certain different way when I'm at here. And the challenge is to, you know, like Alan Watts says, you know, like the the magic of life is not that it's work, but that it's play, right? That kind of thing. So it is, it is still painful, like it is still stressful to have. Oh my god, I got another appointment later or whatever. But like you have to find the humor in it, and you have to find the lightness in it not take yourself too seriously. Yeah, I love that. Um, it reminds me of a Bertrand Russell quote too, where he's writing in praise of idleness and he just I love wish it. he just wishes he's like, there was once a time of more uh play and lightheartedness, right? 
And um, that might be a good uh, point to end. But uh, I appreciate the time today. Where can people find you if they search Visa, K-A-N-V? Yeah. They should find you. That's the best way to find you. Yeah, and you're um, easy to find on Twitter, I would say. Yes, very much so, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Anything else you want to say in terms of, like, with the work you're doing or clients you're trying to find? Or oh, right, anything? yeah. So I am available for marketing consulting. Uh, I do a bunch of things. So I can so – I can. so my specialty was to help uh, kind of early-stage um, SaaS companies flesh out their content strategy and they build out their content team and stuff. I'm good at that. Not a huge, like it's not what I want to do in my life, but I'm good at it. And so if I can help people with it, I like to help people with it. But my favorite thing to do recently has actually been um, to help individuals figure out kind of their personal positioning. So I've done this for a couple of people where I ha- I've helped this, la- this lady who's like a, she's like a semi academic essayist kind of person and she's kind of working in isolation and she's been how do I connect with other people like myself so I'm, I'm like um, I help people with that and you know figuring out like your messaging your positioning how to how to frame things so that people can find you I mean so I spent a lot of trial and error spent a lot of time doing trial and error to do that and I realized that you know initially I felt like should I touch is that is that cheating like is that is that a real job or whatever but I realized that I actually do have a lot of experience with this and I can I can kind of speed run people through this process by helping them think about how they want to frame their Twitter bio what kind of content they should be putting out to be to, to know what you want people to find and how they're gonna find you I can help you with that and um, or just any general kind of marketing um, sparring riffing I do like an hour brainstorm. So the thing I do is like, um, you tell me about what your challenges are. I'll go and look it up and I'll let you know if whether or not I can help. And if I can help, I'll kind of do some reading and research and, and put together like an hour's worth of talk to, you know, like brainstorm some proposals, stuff like that. Well, thanks again, uh, Visa. Looking forward to uh, staying in touch with you and hopefully meeting in person one day. Yeah, I think that will happen surely at some point. Thank you for listening to the Reimagine Work Podcast. It's been such a fun journey to start this podcast, start getting random feedback from around the world, and to continue to meet and have conversations with such amazing people who really helped me learn and in some ways have started to become my friends. I think a podcast that started to push a lot of people to, to create podcasts can be this hack almost to uh, jump through the hoops of the awkwardness of networking that people don't like and actually get down to have a deeper conversation and I found it's been pretty cool to do that. Um, I want to keep this as basically a fun creative endeavor. I don't want to have ads. I think there are a lot of ads out there that you can basically just give a coupon code and you get pretty small dollars on the advertising. I've looked into it. Um, I think it's kind of annoying when you're listening to things, though I think podcast advertising is probably the least bad of any uh, advertising I've seen. Anyway, if you feel compelled to support the podcast, I have a Patreon page. Right now, that is probably the main way to support. So I think for me, asking for contribution or support is really a selfish motive. I'd like to dedicate more of my time to creating, writing, helping people, having these conversations, and just spending a lot more time thinking deeply, reading books, uh, writing about these topics. And if you think that's something worth doing, uh, I'd love to see the show of support. If you have feedback on the podcast, guests you want me to talk to, want to make comments on my monotone voice, you can send them my way. I take any and all comments and just love the support. Uh, Thanks so much for the people listening and let's keep reimagining work.